Recording. How's it going, guys? Good afternoon. Thanks for being here for my tech talk. If you can't tell, it's going to be about the, not that, that is the middle of my slideshow. It is going to be about using D3 to visualize and analyze data. Now, before we get started, analyzing data is a pretty loaded term in the sense that it encapsulates just about anything that anybody says that has anything to do with anything. Because data could be classified as just about anything about the world around us. These windows are data, you guys are data, everything is data. So what is data analysis? I found a good quote, and it is a very general and broad quote, which I think is the best way to describe data analysis. Basically, it is to turn data inf into information and information into insight. So without getting too into the weeds with this, basically you have a wealth of information. There's so much information, we're collecting it every day. I'm sorry, we have data we're collecting every day, but information as well. So what do we do with that? We need to use that to make some sort of decision. So data is kind of messy sometimes. You could have a spreadsheet with the average, with not the average rainfall, but the rainfall per day in Central Park. And so if you think about looking at a spreadsheet, 365 rows, rainfall, temperature, blah, 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 weather, you can't really do much with that on first glance. So we need to take that and turn it into information. Information would be what is the average rainfall per season in Central Park. And so with that information, we can build an insight such as I would prefer to go to Central Park in the springtime because that is when it rains the least. That might not actually be accurate. I think it rains a lot in the springtime, but you know what I'm saying. So that's really the value of data analysis. In bigger picture terms, we could make bigger decisions. It might not be having lunch in the park. It might be, am I going to invest in this company or am I going to divest in this company? And what will the proposed implications of that be? You can't make a decision unless you perform some analysis on the data relevant to that decision. So moving on, there are a couple things that data analysis doesn't encapsulate. And basically, it's really hard to make a 100% determination that one thing causes another. In fact, it might even be impossible. So if you read this, it's a pretty good summary. I know you've all heard a million times, correlation isn't causation. And this is a good little comic about that. But the way I always think about it, let's say you're trying to figure out if a piece of metal is hot. Well, you know that the heat of a piece of metal is correlated to its glow. So if it's glowing very bright red, then it's a hot piece of metal. But if you try to make a piece of metal hot by shining a red light on it, that's not going to work. So at that point, you're thinking, well, if one doesn't cause the other, what's the point? Well, if you see a piece of glowing red metal, then you probably would not touch it. So there, you've done some analysis, and you've used two pieces of information which don't necessarily cause one another to make a decision about whether or not you're going to burn the hell out of your hand. Now, how do we get data? The unfortunate news is for somebody on a student's budget, it's hard to get access to a lot of really easily used big chunks of information. But Yahoo Finance does have historical data on stocks that you can actually download from their site. It will come to you as a CSV, which is going to be useful for a lot of your projects that you're going to do with data. Uh, CSV is a comma separated values file. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's value, comma, value, comma, value. Um, a little bit less useful is the ESPN MLB statistics page. If you're doing a small project, then you might be able to just take it from that page. But as far as I'm aware, there's no way to just wholesale import data from this page. I think that there are some paid sites that do offer those services, but um, ESPN, to my knowledge, is not the place to do that. So now that we've talked about data analysis and like where actually we could reasonably get our data from, I want to talk about D3. D3 is a JavaScript library, and it is short for Data Driven Documents, which isn't really relevant to its use. That's just what it's named. Um, really, it provides a structure for applying transformations to data. So if you think about that slide before, you have this stock data, but how do you use that in a JavaScript application? Well, D3 offers a lot of methods that really enhance your ability to visualize and put that data out there on a DOM for analysis and review. 
And unlike a lot of the stuff that we use today at full stack, it is very much imperative. You have to tell it how to do what you want it to do. And that way, it's a lot like jQuery. And in the projects that I've done with it, I've actually used a lot of jQuery. And I am basically giving my browser a set of instructions, like do this, 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 and this, exactly this way, which some people don't like. I think for D3, it really lends itself to being used that way. Now, D3 is not several things. It is not backwards compatible with browsers. So if anybody is using your site that has a D3 element on it with an old browser, you can generally guarantee that there's not going to be a lot of support there. They're going to run into issues. You're better off just turning it off for people that are accessing it in old browsers. It's not private. So if you have data that you don't want getting out, you should not use D3 because it actually pulls the data onto the client machine and it executes all of the code there. And it is also not automated. Like I said before, you have to tell it exactly what to do. It's not going to fill in any of the blanks for you. What are the elements of a D3 visualization? This is actually where we're going to get into some views of the code. So first of all, we have our data. Like I said before, our data is going to be a comma-separated values file. Above there, you'll see kind of what a comma-separated values file looks like. But below that is how we're actually going to pull this into our application. The D3 library has a function called CSV, which parses a CSV file for data. For data. And as you would assume, yes, there are other ways to get data into D3. But for today's talk, we're just going to talk about the CSV version. Now, these are actually callback functions. So the cool thing here is you can use Bluebird to permissify any D3 functions you may want to use, which is what we've done here. So if you look, we have our stats CSV file. We're running this promise CSV on it. That's going to return a promise for the data, which you can then dot then off of and get rolling with your D3 visualization. Now, Andrew taught us about the SVG in his talk last week, so I'm not going to go too in-depth with this one. But basically, D3 is going to render all of your data in an SVG element. So it's going to use SVG shapes as representations of your data. As far as the shapes, we have stuff like rectangles. We have squares, I believe, which probably isn't separate from rectangles, uh, triangles, all of those fun shapes. Um, we're going to use circles today. So when you use a shape in D3, you are going about it in a strange way. You're actually saying, in the SVG, select all of the circles. Now, you may be thinking, what if I don't have any circles yet? Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. And then, once we have all of the circles in the SVG element, we are going to bind the data to them, which is basically saying this data is going to be represented by circles in the SVG. So that's where we're at now. Now, the good part is this dot enter. There are a number of different methods that exist. Um, there's update and there's exit, but we won't get into those. Dot enter basically says when you invoke this, it's going to check the SVG. And for every item in your data set past the amount of circles that are already in your SVG, like let's say that you already have pre-populated some info in that SVG, it's going to take all of those circles and then start off on your data as soon as you run out of circles and start putting circles into your SVG based off of that data. So if you have six lines on your CSV and two circles on your SVG already, it's only going to give you four through six. So there are ways around that. It's not always the most convenient. Dot update is a way of doing that. Um, but for what we're doing now, we're not going to have any pre-populated pre elements. But if you're overlaying graphs, this might be a problem that you run into. And finally, we are appending the circles. So basically, dot enter is telling us how to append the circles, and then dot append is adding them in. Um, these circles will have attributes. You have CX and CY. These refer to where on the coordinate plane. I say coordinate plane. It's kind of different in a number of key ways. It's going to say where the positioning of these are. So don't get that confused with this X and Y, which are things that I defined for my own personal use. But the interesting thing about this is it is measuring from the top down. So if you think about a coordinate plane, you have this, and this quadrant is positive, positive. But on a browser, you're really looking at this. And instead of down this being negative, instead of down this being negative one, it would actually be one. 
So you kind of have to invert that. If you say negative one, it'll be up over your screen. Um, so you have to kind of change the axes around. I'm sorry, that might not be clear, but hopefully it'll be more clear as we continue on. So now for scale, a good way to describe this is if you've seen Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about the cosmic calendar where they take the entirety of time and try to fit it into a calendar year. So as you can imagine, one day on that calendar is going to be billions of billions of years. So by setting up the scale, we're trying to fit data that might range from zero to one or range from zero to 1,000 into an SVG element that is a fixed size, a number of pixels. So if we have data that's from zero to one and we have a space that's 255 pixels and we try to put it all in the first one pixel of that, it's gonna be a jumbled mess. So we need to use scale to spread it out so that it fills the SVG and that everything has a good spread from one another. Um, here is an example of how we do that. Basically, we take the min and max of the data, and then we run it through this domain and range function. So it takes your input, and that is your domain. So if you have zero to one, your domain is zero to one, and then your range is the size of your SVG. So it'll take zero to one, and if you're going zero to 255, then every one piece of that is going to be spread out quite a bit. And the last thing that we need to do is this correlation coefficient. I'm running out of time, so if you want to know more about this, then I will go over that uh, with you personally. Uh, I do want to get to this demo here and just show you one chart. So let's look at this. Um, if we check out these dog lifespans here, I've basically taken the average weight of a dog and charted that against its median lifespan. So each of these is an SVG circle. They're spread out on this SVG canvas, so to speak. And we actually have functions on our JavaScript file which will calculate and provide information. So this weight is coming from our X attribute that we put onto our circle. And this median lifespan is coming from the Y attribute. So that's why I put those in there. Because I didn't want to get the morphed scaled values. I wanted to get the actual data that was used to create that. And now this correlation coefficient, it's basically a number from one to negative one that measures how strongly these two pieces of data are tied to one another. So a negative 0.81 is actually a strong negative correlation. A uh, correlation of zero means your data is spread throughout and there's almost no correlation at all, which you can see in this chart, which I can't really get into the details of too much, but the data is spread all over. There might be a slight downward correlation between them, but it's nothing worth really noting. Um, so that is my slideshow. I have all of this information and the presentation available on Git. I will slack out the link afterwards and thank you all for listening.